All right, so the activity that we have today, and hopefully you guys all got the uh, instruction packets we sent out, um, is making simple catapults and trebuchets. And there are two different instruction packets. And uh, we usually always start Maybe with the catapult. I see that some people didn't get the instruction oh, packet. Okay. So we can send it out after too, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we could probably drop the link in the chat too. But we'll try to do that in the next minute here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so two separate instruction packets, which if you haven't gotten, you will get them. We'll drop the link in the chat in a second here. And um, these were developed in house. And which screen are people seeing? The, the phone camera? Or... Uh, yes. Okay. So um, very simple. We developed them in house. And uh, they're just a couple pages. You'll get to see them up close. But we have the materials, the goals, some notes um, with general instructions. And then it goes into the step by step instructions. So we'll be starting with the catapult today, which is by far the easier one. And then we'll move into the trebuchet, which uh, has about double the materials, but still very basic office supplies, things you might have around the home or in any kind of craft area. Um, and we use tape, rubber bands, and hot glue guns to put it together. So this is the, uh, the very basic catapult, um, which is super simple, as you can see, and actually works better and is easier to use than the trebuchet, even though the trebuchet is kind of a more fun engineering challenge to build, but very simple. Um, if any of you guys have ever seen this or built something like this before, um, drop a comment in the chat because this is not something that we invented uh, ourselves. This is definitely a traditional engineering challenge. And then the other one we have is the trebuchet. And just for people who aren't familiar, um, a catap the difference between a catapult and a trebuchet, a catapult uses, um, I don't remember the physics term for it, but it uses um, stored energy within the arm or some kind of spring system, where a trebuchet uses a weight and it's more of a lever system to swing it instead of stored energy um, in like a rubber band or um, the tension of uh, a, a stick or something like that. So I'll put the trebuchet out of the way for now and we'll start up with the catapult. So there's only really a few different components to this. Once you get the instruction sheet, you'll see under materials, there's uh, only five materials. Yeah, five materials. Um, there's 10 jumbo craft sticks. You could definitely do it with regular size craft sticks. So these are the jumbo, these are the regular ones. Um, you would just, if you did it with the small ones, you either have to make a slightly smaller catapult um, and then you might wanna end up rethinking what you're shooting with it. What we use to shoot with it is uh, ping pong balls, or you could still use the small ones, but you'd probably want to uh, glue um, a few more of them together and stack them a little bit thicker in order to get the thickness you want. So the main parts of this catapult, as you'll see, are this cross beam right here, which is actually just a, a stack of eight popsicle sticks um, rubber banded together. The only place we actually use hot glue in this whole project is to attach the bottle cap to the top here, which serves as the place that holds the ping pong ball. And um, the rest of it is all just stacked and with rubber bands. So you don't even really need hot glue guns. You could probably use tape um, or some other method to attach the, the uh, bottle cap to the top if you didn't want to have to use hot glue. Um, and very simple from there. And like I said, if you were going to use the smaller popsicle sticks, um, the main issue would not really be this cr first cross beam we're making here, because all you really need is the height and the thickness of the jumbo popsicle sticks and the regular ones are the same. Uh, the bigger issue would be the length of your arm here that's giving you the tension. So you probably want to take at least two of them and overlap them about a third of the way um, to make them a little bit longer to get that tension there. So like I said, 10 jumbo craft sticks is what we need to make the main form of this. And the first part is that cross beam there. So out of the 10 craft sticks, we're using eight of them. So if you did get a chance to grab the materials beforehand, you can follow along. We're just taking eight of our 10, and we're gonna start by putting a couple rubber bands on either side. And depending on how big your rubber bands are, you'll have to wrap them a few times, but you just wanna get it tight enough so that it kind of forms a solid block. This is something you could also do with tape if uh, you're not comfortable with rubber bands or hot glue as well. This hot glue is great for everything. And just wrap this around one rubber band on each side and you'll end up with your stack about this tall right here. Next step, we take our other two craft sticks and we 
um, are going to make our V shape that we're seeing right here. So once again, we're taking a rubber band and we are putting it pretty, basically as close to the end as we can. You'll see on this one, there's only about a third of an inch from this rubber band here to the end of the two popsicle sticks. And this one we do want to get as tight as possible. So make sure to put that around however many times you need to, to get that nice and tight. And this one would probably be a little bit harder to do with tape. Um, with it, when it comes to the, the tension part of this catapult, this V shape here, the rubber bands really do help to keep that tension nice and tight. So once you've created that, you'll have this, this V here that uh, you have to kind of struggle to pull apart. And then we're gonna be taking our cross beam and we're gonna be sliding it into that V so that we're kind of creating some tension and pushing it about as far down in there as it can go. And now it's gonna to wanna to slide back out on you like that. So that's another example of how the tension that powers this catapult works. And once we get it down there, we wanna hold it in place and we're gonna use a rubber band again, another rubber band to keep it in place. So first thing we need to do is slide the rubber band under like this, and then we're gonna cross it over our V-shaped beam. And with a rubber band this big, we're gonna to have to go back and forth at least one more time. So we're crossing over, and then that might be enough, let's see, yeah. We did have a question about whether or not we would be leading the kids through these steps, step-by-step step, to make them. And when we did this with them, we actually did it uh, online, I believe. Yep. And we did go through the steps of this original iteration step-by-step step with them. So yes, but then they took it, as, you'll, as we'll talk about later, they took it and kind of made it their own. And then uh, we had different iterations of it that allowed it to grow farther. And, and those were things that they came up with. Well, that really, I think, depends on the age group you're working with and, um, you know, what type of activity you're running. And like I said, we created this instruction packet um, during COVID. We had the time and the need to create, you know, asynchronous activities that people can do on their own or at home or over virtual. But you definitely don't need to have every student have one of these packets if you're going to be leading them through step by step, especially with the catapult. Um, it's not very complex. Um, but once you make these instruction packets, this is the kind of thing that we're eventually going to have as a resource on our Makerspace website at the library. So one of our longer term goals is to build out a collection of these types of activities that people can do on their own. And that's why we list all the materials right up front and try to make them materials that are easily accessible to people that they might not even have at home um, or can find alternatives for. It's also something I, uh, that we could uh, have out and have the instructions out as a, an activity that people could do even if they came in the children's room or into the workshop and were looking for something simple to do. Um, they could access all those materials. It's also something that I could easily put together into a bag, a takeaway bag um, that people could grab and go. We often have grab and go maker bags available in the children's department and a, a simpler uh, activity like this is something that we use that for as well. Yeah. So yeah, it really it is both. Um, we developed it, we did give it away as just grab and go bags or just we just have them out in the maker space. We have about 10 activity packets like this that use um, prototyping materials. We call them prototyping materials. We have prototyping carts. Uh, like I said, that's the really the first makerspace thing that we had when we started doing this several years ago. Um, and those prototype carts just have all these basic materials in them, tape, popsicle sticks, random cardboard, things that you could use to make anything. So um, yeah, you can do it as a guided activity with a class or you can let them do it on their own. And uh, like we'll discuss a little bit later, um, if you do do it as a guided activity, there's still plenty of opportunities to have the kids expand and explore on their own afterwards. So we have our two cross beam, we have our cross beam connected to our V, done it all with just rubber bands, no glue or tape or anything. And then the last step is very simple. 
we just need to attach our bottle cap. And, you know, bottle caps obviously are very easy to find, but there have been times we didn't have them. And what we did instead is we took little rolls of uh, cardboard that we had that were about an inch in diameter and uh, varying lengths. And you can glue that on, or you can sure you can imagine a number of ways that you could make an alternative. All you really need is something that will hold the ping pong ball um, in place as you compress the lever and then uh, let go of it. So to do that, like I said, we just use our hot glue gun here and we have a little dab on top, which of course won't happen right now. All right. Erna says that small muffin cups work well too. Yeah. Yep. Great suggestion. We have some of those little um, like uh, disposable ramekins that restaurants use for dip that we uh, have used for these before, and that's worked really well. So just a little dab of glue there, and then we pop it on, and you wanna get it as far towards the top of the popsicle stick as possible, but you also wanna leave a little bit of room for you to be able to compress the stick without getting in the way of the ball that's sitting in the cup. So you wanna leave just a little lip there. And when I built this sample <laughs> a few minutes before, I realized that I actually forgot to do that, so. We may see when I try to test fire them in a second that uh, that's going to cause some issues. So very simple, as you can see, and uh, we will show you a quick test fire here. We have some beautiful custom painted ping pong balls from another one of Anne's classes that she ran where they were doing paint. And uh, all you're going to do, like I said, is put your ping pong ball in the little bottle cap. So you're going to compress it and then let it fly. And I wish I could show you how far it went, but they go actually surprisingly far, um, 20, 30 feet. And um, you know that's one of the really easy ways that you can make an activity like this a little bit more um, engaging for students and also get them encouraged to take it to the next level. So usually after we do something like this with students, um, especially older students, we will ask them how they think they can improve on this design. And we usually challenge them to try to use the same basic materials, but to make an improved version. And we'll actually have a competition to see how far they can get it to shoot. And we'll record the, like, the highest distances they can get with just this base model that we've made. And then we'll have them do another round of shooting once they've made their improved version and see if they've been able to get it to go much further. And that's something we do with our activities across the board. We do a lot of simple building activities like this, rubber band powered cars, boats, see how far and fast the car can go, see how much weight the boat can take before it uh, it sinks. You know, we'll just fill a Tupperware with water and do testing like that. So, you know, these kind of really simple hands-on activities um, have a lot of uh, mileage that you can do with them. Um, uh, someone put in the chat that it would be interesting to challenge have to challenge the kids to see what they could use to launch besides like a bottle cap. Yeah. yeah, and we actually for a second thought that we didn't have our ping pong balls today. So Ann and I were both kind of scrounging to figure out what we could do as alternatives. And I made a ball out of uh, clay, Sculpey clay. We found some pom poms. Um, we got some styrofoam balls. So it's also interesting to see what kind of alternative things you can shoot with them. And then you can even talk about, you know, from a material science standpoint, how far things fly, what would be the ideal weight for things to fly. Um, and, uh, you know, you can really go pretty in depth with that. And then obviously with things like this, you can do a whole lesson on levers or uh, I still can't remember the actual term for it, but the kind of uh, force that is stored in a, uh, a tension thing like this, you know, figuring out how much strength comes out of something under tension like that. Oh, and kids could design, could design targets as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole nother challenge, trying to get these things to be accurate as opposed to uh, just shooting as far as possible. Um, and then you can also talk about the release arc. That comes more into play with the trebuchet as I can show in a minute here. But, you know, obviously, when you talk about the distance that something, a ball is flying through the air and its trajectory, um, you try to figure out the optimal release angle. Is the 45 degree launch angle going to get you the furthest or a slightly lower one with higher speed, slightly higher one with lower speed? So 
Um, those are all things that we've experimented with this before. And, you know, like we said, we, we traditionally do this with students age um, like five to 14 or 15, but I've done the same activity starting with this very basic model with high school students and then turn it into a week long activity where they end up building, you know, scale catapults this big that are much more complex. So um, it really serves as a starting point to get students engaged and interested in uh, all sorts of different science and STEM uh, topics. Does anyone have any questions so far? I just put something in the in the um, chat about any safety tips or facilitation tips about like classroom management because with things flying around the room, there's probably tips that Anne you can share about working with young children that are that sound fun, but they're actually safety facilitation things that you could share with the group. Sure. So we do recommend that you have some space. Um, we and we tend to give them a target because that will help give them a reason to be shooting it. We have them take turns. Often they're working in pairs. Um, so one team at a time has a chance. The rest of the kids are standing uh, off to the side. Um, and then we take time to measure. We do keep an eye on what we're using as different uh, projectiles. Um, we usually don't give them the projectiles until it's time to test either. So exactly. like Ann said, we'll set aside one part of the room. Uh, luckily, our workshop has like a small L to it with only a fire escape at that end. So we kind of have like an extra little hallway. We set up that as the shooting gallery. And then we don't even let them have the projectiles until they're on the testing line. And if we're very fortunate to have that sort of dedicated space, but if I, I'm just picturing if I were doing maybe uh, you know, maybe I'm doing it in a children's room or uh, somewhere where I don't have that particular dedicated space. Um, having them take turns and they don't get the the thing that they're shooting the projectile until it's their turn to do that. And there is a a target and a stopping, you know, uh, spot. Like I wouldn't shoot it down a hall uh, hallway that was where the public was walking and really would certainly slip on it. But I think it comes down to taking turns, keeping the projectiles until they got their first um, uh, pedal constructed, and then choosing, thinking about what you're choosing uh, as a projectile. Any other questions on the catapult or what we've done so far? I'm curious if anyone in the group has done a catapult activity and maybe has another way they've done it or. All right, well, feel free to continue putting anything in the chat that you think of while we're moving forward. So yeah, so that's kind of our first iteration to this kind of activity. And then, like we said at the beginning, we also have the trebuchet activity. And this really does take it to the next level. Um, there's a, a lot more materials, um, a lot more steps. Uh, it takes a lot more careful building and patience to be able to put this together. And on top of that, um, it's not as easy to shoot something out of. Um, if you, once you do have the instructions, you can kind of take a look at how much more complex the design of a trebuchet is in general, in general, and then specifically, you know, compared to how very simple this catapult is, um, how much more complex this trebuchet is. But what's great about that is that it gives students so much more room to experiment and play around um, when it's not as simple and there's a lot more differences. And what we usually, what I've found at least with doing this activity is that students usually don't end up, even with their first go, don't end up making their trebuchet exactly as is seen in these instructions here. Because there are so many more steps, they usually end up making modifications as they're going. And it's always interesting to see um, how that manifests itself. And you'll also see that with the trebuchet, we're not able to use ping pong balls 
as our um, projectile. And in fact, the projectile is something that you need to manufacture as well with the trebuchet. So in the case of the instructions we have here, um, what we've done in the past and what they recommended is just taking a piece of pencil eraser and uh, putting a little string, connecting a little loop of string to it. And that's what launches off of, um, off of our uh, paper clip here. And what that really gives you the opportunity to experiment as well, as I mentioned, is the release angle. Because uh, depending on how this little end of the paper clip here is bent, uh, that determines at what angle the arm is at when your projectile releases. Um, so I actually don't have a projectile built right now, but maybe we can just use something like this to start. And as it comes around, it'll be sticking out from the G-forces. And only when it reaches the point where this arm right here is uh, far enough forward past vertical or even getting to horizontal, will it launch off? And uh, that also gives you the ability to play around with the weights. So you'll see that on this one, they recommend using battery. I'm always curious as to why they use batteries for things like this. I guess they just happen to be very dense for their size. So they make a good option for weights like this. But um, you can see they're using one AA battery. And this sample one that I already built here is quite a bit beefed up already from the one that they have in the sample here. It's got a lot more weight. And in their sample, they use regular popsicle sticks. And in our sample here, um, I've used the jumbo popsicle sticks. So we're getting a lot more length on the arm. We're able to put a lot more weight in. And um, this is just a perfect example of how you can allow students to experiment to get better results with it. So we can do a quick um, run through of how we build this. And this one actually requires a base plate as opposed to the catapult. So we usually just like to use pieces of cardboard here. I'm sure if you guys are already doing any kind of STEM or maker activities, you know, always save your boxes because it really uh, makes it a lot easier to have things to paint on or use your hot glue on. And the first thing we have to do here is build our A-frame. Oh, and just in case any of you don't have the instructions in front of you yet, um, there's maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 different items um, in terms of materials for this one. So we have our cardboard base. Uh, the, this basic version calls for eight regular size popsicle sticks. You're gonna need some scissors. And actually I find that having um, a pair of pliers, either uh, this kind right here or um, some needle nose pliers with the wire cutter is very helpful because you will have to either break or cut popsicle sticks to a specific length. Obviously, you can break them by hand, but um, I like being able to actually get a clean cut. Um, you're going to need a jumbo straw. So that's what we're looking at right here. You can get these online very easily. They're basically a boba straw, maybe even a little thinner than like a boba, tree, boba tea straw. Um, you're going to need some tape. Blue painter's tape is always great for activities like this, but you can use duct tape, you can use masking tape, you can use um, scotch tape even, uh, although scotch tape is sometimes a little bit weak. Um, rubber bands again, and also a little bit of string. We like to use uh, some hemp like this, but any kind of thin string around this size and gauge will work as well. Um, a paper clip, which creates our launching arm there. On a real catapult or trebuchet, it would have been a hook. Uh, that a sling was attached to and that sling one arm of it would release sort of like an old slingshot and uh, then one double a battery but that can be it's not used for electronics obviously that's just creating our weight and they recommend a binder clip although i've never actually used it um, in the versions that i make so the first thing we need to do is create our a frame so there's two sides to our uh, trebuchet and if we look at it from the side we need to have two a frames just like this so I was out of the way. Sorry, guys. So we're going to start just by putting a dab of glue almost at the top. And it is important that when we create these, we leave some room at the top here because we're going to need our dowel or our pencil, whatever we use as our cross arm, to be able to sit on top of there. So we want to leave a little bit there so it almost looks like a very simple drawing of a teepee or something. And then uh, I like to match my arms 
So a very useful way of doing that is to use the first set you make as a guide for your second set. So you can lay them on top and that way you'll know where to put your glue dab and glue it so that it uh, ends up being as close as possible to the previous side that you made. Otherwise your whole trebuchet will be a little bit crooked. So lay that right on top there and glue it on. Okay. And then the next step, which can be a little bit finicky, is getting these to stand up um, at the correct distance and straight from each other. So one way that the cardboard base can be helpful is that with corrugated cardboard, you can often poke your the feet of your uh, popsicle sticks into the cardboard a little bit. I don't know if you could hear that, but you can see I was just able to poke it in enough that it sort of stands up on its own. Um, and then you can end up securing it more so with some glue. So I'm going to do that first. And then we're going to put on some cross beams to help support it. And in the, if you have the instructions in front of you, you'll see that the cross beams are a little bit higher up on the side. And that's the first place you would traditionally want to cut your, uh, your popsicle stick. So I guess we'll do it on the show there. And we'll put, we'll cut our popsicle stick just about in half. And then we can apply it to the side here to make our A frame. Put a little bit of dab of glue right on the ends of each there. We want to use the full length of it. And then we can pop it on the side here. And then, like I said, once we apply these side braces to our A frame, we are going to need to secure it to the base plate a little bit stronger. And there are a couple of ways to do that. If you look at the instructions, once again, you'll see that they have used like popsicle sticks cut into quarters um, to make kind of partial cross beams. It's very tempting to put a popsicle stick just across the bottom here and connect it to the ground. I've tried to do that before, and then I realized that uh, that will get in the way of the action of the trebuchet as it pulls the weight, uh, as the weight comes down, it pulls your projectile through. So one way you can kind of get away with that is to just start by putting some glue into the little holes in the corrugated cardboard you made, and then putting another cross beam right across the bottom. Like this. Or you can do it just the way they show in the instructions, where you're taking a small piece like this, about a quarter, a third, and you're gluing it just like that. Both of them will give you pretty good results. So I'll do one on either side. And we can kind of see if one works better than the other. And you can really quickly see how easy it is to encourage um, exploration of your students on their own to try to figure out what works best. Um, there are a lot of different ways that this can be built. And it's always really interesting to see what designs hold up stronger and what designs are able to shoot further. Um, one of the other favorite engineering challenges that I like to do with students, more so high school, but all ages, is uh, building a tower or some kind of structure that, and the challenge is to be able to support the most weight possible. And we've had multiple times where students built towers, you know, a foot or two tall out of just popsicle sticks and dowels and, you know, uh, hot glue guns. And we've been able to put like 60, 70 pounds of books on top of it before it breaks. So uh, it's really amazing. The students usually really enjoy uh, those kind of challenges. We had a question in the chat about the age, youngest age of the children that we've worked with who've been successful. And um, I said that, you know, the youngest was six uh, and he did work quite a bit with a peer, uh, an older peer. Um, and we're always around to offer support as well. We have a nice model of this group that meets is we have teams who act as mentors to the younger students and are there as support um, and sort of as coaches mm -hmm. uh, and to help them think about 
uh, you know, what they could do really help um, facilitate their learning, not instruct them as much. But on a project like this, they might sit together and work through the steps together. But it's a nice opportunity for our teens to get experience working with younger children um, and uh, learning about how to kind of facilitate um, this kind of a workshop um, with young kids. Yep. So the next step here is building our cross beam. So we have a dowel right here, but if you have the instructions, you can see they used a pencil. Um, any kind of round shaft like this is really all you need. And this, uh, with this design, one thing I really like about it is that we're actually able to secure this main uh, structural sh um, shaft directly to our A beams because we're using this uh, straw here as kind of our pivot sleeve. So the straw goes over that and that's able to spin freely. That's what the arm's gonna be attached to. And then this is able to become a structure or member. Whereas with sometimes some of the designs I've seen, they want, instead of the straw, they want this whole thing to be able to move. And then it's just too easy to come up off of it. So, you know, just by adding this one little simple straw here, we get a lot more strength out of our frame. So uh, you can either attach this directly right now, or you can do it once you attach the arm to it. Um, either way works just fine but we're gonna use a rubber band again for that. Now, these are just your standard, your very standard, I don't know what model they are, uh, rubber bands, but um, some smaller ones work really well for this. Um, in the instruction packet example, you'll see that they use those kind of almost like uh, the very small hair elastics. They're about the size of the tip of a finger um, in diameter and very, very thin. And those are strong enough and work really well for what we're doing. Um, but these bigger ones can work too, as long as you uh, wrap them multiple times. So kind of the same way that we attached the cross beams here, we're going to go over the popsicle stick first, cross it, and then go over the, the popsicle stick again, and then just keep doing that over and over again, crossing and back. So see, we're crossing over here and then on the back side. And we're just going to keep doing that until our rubber band is tight enough to hold it in place. Although we can't go too tight because if we do, it will crush the straw too much and it won't be able to spin. And in fact, I just did that. <laughs> so don't go too crazy. And that's, you know, that's probably another reason why those very thin um, hair elastics work well, because um, you're not going to get too crazy and make them be able to make it too tight with those. So you don't really have to worry about the issue that I just had. So going over it two times might be enough. So just make two X's and then or maybe just the third. There that we go. That was one of the trickiest parts with the kids was the whole crossing back and forth. Yeah, and that can actually be hard to show on camera. And if you've never done anything, well, you're watching me, it's difficult to show on camera. And um, if you've never, you know, played around with rubber bands or with string, it's uh, it can be hard to conceptualize what's actually happening there. But with the regular size rubber band, I went around about three times and now you can see, or I made three X's over it and now you can see that it's not crushing it to the point where it's an issue. So now we can go ahead and attach it to our, uh, attach our cross beam to our A frame here. In the instructions, they just use some of those rubber bands to hold it in place but I'm just gonna use some hot glue. And if you want to, you can still reinforce it with uh, more rubber bands. And you just wanna make sure that with your hot glue or whatever you're using, you don't accidentally get it onto the straw because that still needs to be able to spin freely. But there we go. Okay. So now there's only a couple more steps to the main part of it here. And the first one is attaching our battery. Now, I believe that the the clip here, yeah, so um, in the instructions, the uh, binder clip is what they use to attach the battery, which is the weight to the end of our arm here. And I usually end up just taping it, but you absolutely can do it the way they intend and just use the clip to hold it on there. And that does work pretty well, as you can see. And then the last step is to attach our paper clip which is gonna be our launcher. Now, if you have the instructions, like I said, you can see up close the way that a trebuchet is meant to work 
if you uh, if you've never seen one before. The uh, it's a sling right here, and one end of the sling is permanently attached to it, and then the second end of the sling is coming off a little metal peg right there. And basically, when that peg gets past the horizontal or past the vertical point, um, that that one end of the sling is able to slip off and it releases it. Um, and that's the same idea we're trying to get here, except um, we're not attaching our sling directly to the arm. We're just attaching uh, our pin, and then the sling is actually attached to our projectile that we made. So um, this is a great place to use tape. I think this really is the one of the only places we use tape in this. Yeah, if you use the uh, the binder clip for your battery, then this is basically the only place you use tape in this activity. So we'll go ahead and tape this down now. And then we may need to, there's a lot of fine adjustments that you can end up doing with this uh, paper clip to get it to be the right release angle. So it really is um, a great activity for getting students to understand um, some of the physics of what's going on here. All right. And then the last thing is we can try to create our projectile. So this is the only place where the string comes in. And like I said, instead of having the sling attached to the, uh, the arm itself, we're creating the sling and attaching it to our projectile. Now they used a pencil eraser for theirs. I'm just using this little ball that we had. And um, I'm just going to use some tape to create a little loop attached to the weight that we're using for our projectile. So here we go. Little tape. And we want to have the string on one side attached and then on the other side of the projectile. So we have a nice little loop. And you can really just make this a tape ball. You know, um, if you don't have a uh, if you don't have a pencil eraser, you don't want to rip one off your pencil, or you don't have like a perfect thing, it doesn't have to be a super heavy projectile, it doesn't have to be round either. As you can see. This is not round, and if you're using a pencil eraser, that's obviously not round either. So you don't have to have anything perfect going on. It doesn't have to be particularly heavy. It does not, no. Um, in fact, it shouldn't be, because all we have for our launch is our weight. So, you know, once again, this projectile I'm making is just on the fly. It's not what the instructions say, but it's what we had on hand. So there we go. So this is the basic idea that you want. Okay? You want to have whatever your projectile is with a loop attached to it. And then that loop is going to go onto your little pin here. And you can see here actually that this paper clip is too long. So it may not launch. And the general way that this works, oh, I can pull my arm back. So that's one of the nice things about using the rubber band instead of like gluing the cross beam arm onto it is that you can make adjustments to the length of it um, and how much is on the weight side and how much is on the projectile side. So this is done in theory, but like I said, this usually does not work the first time. So we'll give it a quick try. So as I let go of this, in theory, it should launch and the projectile should fly off of the pin when it reaches around here. It most likely will not shoot, but that's the fun of activities like this. So let's see what happens. Nope, not enough there. So that's the basic idea though. Let's see if our bigger one will shoot now that we have a projectile. This one's scary. Don't shoot it right at the big <laughs> TV. Let's shoot okay. it there. All right, let's see, fingers crossed. That one went, we got about eight feet, a nice arc. So you see the idea there but you can see why these things um, give a lot more room for playing around, experimenting, and figuring out how to make it work. So like I said, the trebuchet is, there's a lot more there than the catapult in terms of building it for one, a lot more precise construction. And then there's also the fine tuning to get it to shoot. And the fact that you don't have a standardized projectile. 
So it definitely adds a lot more uh, difficulty to it, but it's also a lot more satisfying for the students to have that experience of being able to fine tune it and get it to work. So those are our, our catapult and our trebuchet models. Um, and we've used them quite a bit. They're pretty popular. And uh, you know, it doesn't have to be this exact thing, but these type of building challenges really are the foundation of uh, our maker programming that we started with. And now we've obviously expanded on to much more advanced equipment and maker tools, laser cutters, 3D printers, but these kind of things are really great for getting people introduced. So we've been getting some questions. Uh, so we do have a question about how do you work the hot glue gun? So uh, I'll let you demonstrate, but... Uh... So the hot glue gun, um, it's funny, I always, when people ask me about how 3D printers work, I always say it's like a hot glue gun, except with a computer controlling it and plastic instead of glue. But um, basically it just has um, a, a tip here that gets very, very hot. So that is one thing that you have to watch out for with kids. We usually set them up at a separate table from where the kids are working if they're very young. And we'll have them come up one at a time and kind of guide them through it because the tip is hot enough to burn if they accidentally touch themselves. Um, but you have these, glue sticks that then feed into this hole at the back here. And whenever you pull the trigger, that just moves the glue stick through the project, I mean, through the uh, the gun here. And then, like yeah, like a caulk gun or what else there? Almost, it's just like a toothpaste tube with a trigger. That's much, very, very hot. <laughs> and uh, you squeeze it and the hot glue comes out. And then you have, um, depending on how much glue you squeeze out, you have five, 10, 15, 20 seconds before it starts to harden. So you can take your, uh, whatever you're connecting, kind of push it in there and uh, it dries pretty quickly. As soon as it cools, it, uh, it hardens. So it's a really great way for building. It's probably one of the preferred methods for doing these kind of engineering challenges, as long as you feel like you can do it safely with the age group you're working with. Um, because it's so flexible, it's very quick. You don't have to wait for glue to dry like with Elmer's or even super glue. Um, and like I said, it's very strong. We've had kids make things out of popsicle sticks and hot glue and toothpicks that can hold 70, 80, 90 pounds of weight um, on pretty flimsy looking structures. So it, it definitely is very uh, a great, great tool to have for these kind of quick engineering challenges. Thank you. Whitney asked, um, do we find that an hour is enough time with the children to build the catapult as well as troubleshoot it? And also how many children do we have in one session? I think it depends. The number of children might depend on the age. Um, the younger you have, the more supervision you'll need. Uh, the catapult is a simpler project, um, so more uh, appropriate for younger children um, and wouldn't require as much supervision, but the trebuchet has a lot more steps to it. Um, so um, older children might be able to manage it a little bit more on their own, uh, but so that, that might, but I would say we, I mean, our group is 10 children and then we have uh, three or four team mentors that help out. Uh, so again, it depends on on the age of your children, I think. And then I would say an hour to an hour and a half, maybe maybe an hour and a half yeah. to build and give them enough time to troubleshoot and actually get it to work, and then give them time to. Uh, modify it and, and try some of these different iterations. Yeah. Uh, typically, our STEAM club is either an hour and a half or two hours, uh, depending on what the project is. Right. Uh, and then, uh, let's see. The Sherburn Public Library asked what we would suggest to make a smaller trebuchet actually work in case we don't have the larger possible space? Um, you know, the smaller trebuchet should be able to work. Um, I think, the if I'm guessing right now, I think the main issue is that we have the jumbo size paper clips. 
And I think that that's just a little bit too big. If I, I'm guessing that if I just cut it down so I could have, uh, um, so the issue right now with how long the paper clip is, is that in order to get the arm high enough up for the weight to fall with any force, um, I had to bend the paper clip this much. And I think that is too far. I think the release angle should probably be more like that. And then we're probably not getting enough angle there, but um, there's nothing inherently wrong with this design. We've gotten them to work at this size many times, um, just requires a little bit of fine tuning. Actually, it's kind of cool when it doesn't work and then you have to make a few changes and then it does work. And then that's suddenly where the learning occurs. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, is, it is tough sometimes to get, especially younger kids to not get frustrated with it. But, um, you know, that really is one of the things that we try to really instill in the students we work with, or if we're trying to, you know, start a maker program from the beginning, get them to understand that this is about exploration, that there's going to be failures, and that failures often give you the opportunity to learn more than if something works the first time. You know, if they just put this together and got lucky and it worked off the bat, then they're not really learning as much about uh, you know, what the angles need to be, what the lengths need to be, how much weight needs to be on one side versus the other side of the arm. So you really do learn more when things go wrong. So it's all about trying to get them to understand that that's part of the fun instead of seeing it as a failure. And I have to say that uh, Seiji, one of the best things he ever told me, and he has to tell me all the time still, is I don't have to know everything. Learning together with the students that we're working with is well, it's half the fun, but it also allows them to see that we're learning too. That whole balloon car thing that we did last week, I didn't know anything about it. So we found a YouTube video and and pulled the simple materials together, and then everybody experimented with it and. Did, there was so much learning happening, and it was the six-year-old's idea to begin with, just so you know, so you never know where the ideas are going to come from, and he ended up being very successful at it, but all of them were watching each other and uh, sharing ideas back and forth, and so they they really get into learning things together and working collaboratively many, much of the time. I do have to say, though, going back to the, the trebuchet, the smaller trebuchet question, though, the smaller trebuchet, even when it does work, is by no means as satisfying to shoot as the catapult. Um, it just by the nature of how small it is and the physics going on with the trebuchet, it, you know, your projectile is much smaller than uh, than the ping pong ball, and it, it will never shoot as far as the ping pong ball from the catapult. So um, something to keep in mind, but it still is a great activity. Um, to do with the kids and uh, but maybe more enjoyable for a slightly older uh, group that won't be as frustrated if it doesn't shoot as well as the catapult does. Are there any other questions or comments? You're welcome. We're going to thank you. <laughs> Um, we are really excited to be part of Library Makers, the Library Makers community, uh, where we're work, working and meeting library staff from across the country and, and the, the, that are at different points in their making journey and uh, uh, being able to share things like this and, and uh, answer questions for each other and um, so we're glad that you were able to be with us today. We're glad that Pam was able to join us. And I hope that um, if you have other suggestions for us, you know, you can reach us at um, info at librarymakers.org. If you have suggestions or questions, um, we have Facebook group. We, Heather, we try to offer these once a month. Um, and we do have uh, a calendar of activities. Pam, is it on our website? Um, you know, we're a, a newer organization and um, I wanna thank Seiji and Anne for being part of forming this because we think it's so great to connect with other libraries who do this work so that you can learn from one another and support each other. 
we are about to develop a new website um but for right now you can find our things on our facebook group which is called library makers and you can also find our listings on the makers in the library.org website um soon we'll also have a library makers.org website but it's just not quite there yet um but the makers in the library.org website um lists our things too so you can find us in these places and we want to know what would be of most value to you? We would really like to know what would you like to see demonstrated or what would you like to talk with other librarians about? Um, where in the journey are you? Are you pretty advanced? Are you starting out? And since we wanna fashion and design and, and create these experiences that are really the most relevant to your needs. So feel free to reach out anytime and let us know, oh gosh, I really need to know about how to use the Cricut or I really need to know how to manage attendance and do registration, whatever it is, or fundraise or market or any of those things for your library maker space and maker program, let us know. And we wanna be a, a resource for all of you for that. Definitely. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day on Friday. And we hope to see you at next month's Steam Speaker. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much.